Hey, Richmond. Uh, I'm always looking forward to catch up with you. Uh, we haven't met each other for a number of years, so it's nice to have you on my podcast. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's uh, it has been about four years, so it's just, you know, I think the first time we're actually catching up since then. But it's uh, it's good to see you again. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, let's set the scene. Can you share with us your career journey, briefly? Talking about how you make career transition again and again, and yeah, let's start off with this very broad question because you successfully career transition again and again. I think it lasts that can right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess just for your for your your, your listeners and viewers, uh, what I'm doing right now is product manager consulting. So I, I run my own consultancy, but uh, if we rewind rewind a little bit back, uh, I've I've done a number of different things. So. Um, legal practice. So I've, I've trained as a lawyer. Uh, I've also done journalism um, and also worked at, at product management at uh, the multinational level, but also the startup level uh, in, in both Asia and, and Toronto. So um, it's been, a you know, I think an interesting um, set of some career circumstances and experiences. But uh, in terms of, you know, answering your question of how I made the transitions, um, I think that the main thing for, for people, or I shouldn't say that, but for myself at least, and maybe hopefully people can take away from it, um, mm. is um, for me, I never really very strictly planned it out. Uh, for mm. me, it, it, it was focusing on my strengths and mm. then uh, just taking the opportunities as they came up. So for example, um, when I graduated college, you know, I had always had an interest in writing. Uh, I knew I was good at it. So uh, you know, that's how I made the transition into journalism. Did a lot of freelance, um, made cold calls. You know, I didn't, I didn't apply, I didn't apply through, through the front door. So I got into um, two of the largest magazines in Canada at the time uh, through cold calls. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I when it came to to, to law school and, and training as a lawyer, again, I was focusing on my strengths in in writing and reading and uh, you know business thinking. When I left that to move into product management, it was. Um, Focusing on my strengths in on the business side of things, and then um, you know added um, uh, uh, you know the, the the skill of coding, and then that that's led me to where I am right now to to run my own consultancy. Beautiful. So you have a very uh, wide range of uh, experiences uh, and also skill sets. Mm, so what do you think a dream job is and is not? Yeah, my, I think a dream job is one that, you know, as cliches that are cliched as it sounds, is one where you feel fulfilled. Um, mm. And I think a lot of times where, you know, the way you feel fulfilled is building on your strengths. So for me, it's been um, written and, and verbal communication. That's a huge strength of mine. Um, and that led me to uh, managing fairly large projects for a couple of the multinationals I've worked with. Um, mm. You know, I never would have had those opportunities had I not leveraged my my my, my strengths. Um, I did, you know, learn adjacent skills that I thought were important. So, for example, I learned coding. Um, it's not really a strength of mine. I'm not, you know, I can do it. I'm, I'm just not really that good at the moment. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get better at it. But, um, you know, that's why I didn't really become a developer after the coding bootcamp. I stayed on the product management path because mm. I knew that that was where, where my advantage was. Um, thinking commercially. Um, that's something I learned from my 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 legal practice days, thinking about the client, uh, and combining it with um, technology skills and design skills that I picked up down the line um, when I transitioned over to product management. So, um, wherever you're picking up a new skill set, uh, can you share with us your thinking process uh, about which skill set to pick up? Uh, because there are opportunity costs. Uh, we can not learn everything in the world, but we have to prioritize. Can you share with us the prioritization process in your head? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the the first step for me is always um, where is the world going? So that's based on, um, mm -hmm. you know, me collecting information, whether it's from news sites or YouTube or talking to people, but it's it's just thinking about where do I think the world is, is going? So for example, um, the reason I picked up coding was, was you know, even though I'm, I don't work full time as a developer, uh, you know, the, the world is going to get more and more, more and more um, dependent on software. It's not going to get less dependent. 
And so I wanted to be able to dig in the guts and, and, and really, um, you know, be able to work with it, at least on some basic level. Um, there's a great book called um, uh, Flash Foresight by Daniel Burris. And he's, uh, you know, a pretty well-known futurist. And what he talks about is uh, soft trends and hard trends. So soft trends is, um, well, let's start with hard trends. So hard trends is, uh, it, it, it's, um, as the name suggests, something that is basically irreversible. So, for example, communications and soft and, and uh, phones are going to get smaller and smaller and more and more decentralized. So things like yeah. blockchain, that, that's not going to, we're not going to go back in time, right? Mm -hmm. So, or we think about transportation, you know, when we move from horses to cars, we're not going to go back to horses. That That is an irreversible trend, so hard trends. Soft trends is something that, uh, it is a trend that can be reversed. So for example, if we think about, um, you know, countries like Singapore and Korea, and, you know, have had issues with uh, population uh, growth, you know, they're below the, the reproductive, um, uh, I don't remember what the term is, but 2.1 births per, mm. per, per, per family is what you need to, to have to maintain your population. If you fall below that, you, your population drops, but that is a soft trend because you can put in policies, for example, at the government level to change that. So to, to answer your question, I think about hard trends mm. um, and, and to a certain extent, soft trends as well. So for me, it was coding uh, when I lived in Asia and even now when I'm back in North America, I'm Mandarin. So I'm, I'm again, I'm, I will never be as good as a native Mandarin speaker, but I, I me you know, I still, <laughs> yeah, so I still I put in the practice um, and that's how I think about it with uh, writing, writing trends, writing mm. um, trends that I think will be will be uh, fairly persistent and enduring. Mm, totally agree. Uh, so let's move on to the portal management uh, session or for this session. So how to break in and what to do after the people land the job? How does someone break into the portal management role of Tanzu without prior experiences? Uh, yeah, can you please talk about different types of scenarios? fresh graduate or with new technology business background uh, and yeah and some specific actions they can take yeah so you know uh, regardless of whether they're a fresh graduate or somebody a bit more experienced but with no prior background in product management i think the the first thing to, to the really the first mindset or the basic mindset to have is how do you improve a business um so yeah. i wouldn't or at least the way i've done it is i've never thought of it as i am a product manager uh, it's just a title that was given to me when I was working in a startup and also at the multinational. They just they just call it product management. But my mindset has always been, how do I grow a business? And at the same time, um, which company grow is that? When when yeah. they give you when they want you to have that title, which company? Walter is it, it? It's every every single company out there. Oh, so, oh okay, so, cool. So so what I mean is they 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 they, they take these set of skills. Mm -hmm. growing a business and they and they give it a neat little title called product management you know and, mm -hmm. and it's in, in every city in every uh in every company in the world they just call it product management but you know no matter what your role is mm -hmm. what i at least what's worked for me is i always think about how do i grow the business mm -hmm. and at the same time grow my own career so what are the key skills i need to learn so sales is a key skill mm -hmm. that you need in any role marketing is a skill you need project management and then product management as well. So how to build a product that people want and also communication skills, both internally with your colleagues. So there's a certain way you talk, you should be speaking when you're speaking with your uh, colleagues that you probably should be tailoring and, and, and changing a little bit tweaking when you're speaking to your clients. So there's thinking uh, how you talk to people, your colleagues internally and how you talk to the clients externally. There's a different ways of thinking that you, that, sorry, different ways of, of talking that you need to, to do. So you know, to answer your question, uh, that starting with that mindset, and then in terms of breaking in, if you don't have any prior experience, you know, I would recommend working on side projects for free, starting your own, or even probably even better is approaching an existing company. Usually it's probably a smaller company, like a early stage startup. And just saying, hey, you know, this is my background. These are the skills I can offer. I'll, I'll be happy to work for you for free hmm. for a month, two months, three months, six months, whatever it is that you, you want. And mutually works for, for, for you and the company. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people overlook that because, um, you know, recently there's been this whole thing where, you know, uh, I think it's more so prevalent in North America than, than Asia, where they, they say it's always wrong to work for free. You should never do it. They should always pay. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, I mean, 
you know, what are you losing by, you know, if you already have a job or you're in, you're in school, just take your, you know, an extra, the five hours of a week that you spend watching Netflix, just use it to, to, to build your skills, you know, build your career. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I would, how would I recommend working, uh, breaking in is work for free, but, but add, make sure you add value, you know, so that, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. Got it. So to keep on uh, work for free, uh, a side project and uh, make sure that uh, when you are working for free, you have to provide value. You, you, you are not going to do some what is work. And even though you are, you are working for free, that's mm, useless. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so when a person, okay, after I break in, uh, is in I'm in a uh, junior product management role. What base nice skills do they need to acquire other than the, uh, the skills that you just mentioned, which I totally agree with sales, marketing, the mindset, how to grow business, any other skills that they need to have on the job? I would say on top of those thinking uh, commercially or thinking from a business perspective. So, um, you know, it, it's not just about um, building something interesting or building something for the sake of building something, but it's building something to build the business. So the reason you're building these features or you're building up a, a, new, a new service mm -hmm. is to grow your business. And the way you grow your business is to provide something that's valuable to your clients or to your customers. So I think that's the baseline. It's not really, I don't know if it's a skill, but it's a mindset that people, especially juniors, uh, you know, really need to get into their head. And it's, you know, something I learned very early in my career when I started, uh, you know, legal practice is they drilled into our head is, you know, they call it the practice of law, but we're, you're not doing law for the sake of doing law. Uh, law school doesn't teach you that, but a law firm will teach you that. We're in this business. It's a business mm -hmm. of law to help our clients. That's how, that's how, you know, that's, that's how we grow the business. So that mindset, I think, carries over every single job role, no matter if it's product management or not. Got it. So, um... I have the mindset, uh, I want to move up the ladder. I'm at a junior, say like I'm an associate product manager. Um, what are the results that uh, these people have to go after? I know that uh, I have to improve the business, but I'm still a small potato in this company. Uh, I have many areas that I can touch on, but I'm uh, uh, Pass, uh, someone pass me the responsibility. That's the piece that I'm responsible for. Uh, mm, yeah, what are the results they have to go after to, mo to move up the ladder, to advance the career? Yeah, so if we're talking about um, moving up the career ladder. I think mm. one of the biggest skills is to think about what um, people within the business want. So of course you have, we, you know, when you're working in a company, there is that sort of uh, one North Star, they call it, right? Or, or, or maybe several North Stars. But um, on a day to day basis, it's thinking about, you know, if you have a manager, uh, what your manager wants, but also, especially at some larger companies, is thinking about what people in, in adjacent teams want. So whether mm -hmm. they are more senior than you or are the same level at the peer level, is thinking uh, expansively about what, what do the different teams want. So if you're a product manager, what, what does the marketing? team want? What does the marketing team specialist want? What does the marketing team VP want? Mm. Doing that for every single role that you touch, and even roles that you don't necessarily interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether it's customer uh, customer fulfillment or customer success, um, operations, is thinking about what other people in your company want and what's important to them. And that's how you know they can share skills and make introductions, relationships uh, open to you. Mm -hmm. uh, versus keeping the door shut is, is, is thinking that way. Got it. So this is the mindset. Um, is there an example that, uh, or actions that you can share with the audiences, what they can do? I may mean, say like, if I'm acting like a bumblebee, uh, I am a mm, associate product manager and then I just keep randomly uh, to initiate formal or informal uh, lunch beat up uh, with someone in different departments, something like that. Do you have any examples? Yeah, so uh, you, you gave a great example, you know, initiating lunches 
um, and also always providing value. I mean, it's not just there's a certain ex certain extent where you know just being social isn't going to be enough. You're going to have to be able to provide real career and business value to those conversations. So initiating lunches, also um, volunteering to make their lives easier. So if there's a certain project, you can say, hey, you know, let me take it on. I'll deal with that mm -hmm. spreadsheet. You know, I'll deal with that spreadsheet. I'll do the you know, I'll do the emails, I'll do the, 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 the I'll, I'll do the cold calls, those sorts of things that are maybe necessary, you know, not necessarily in your job, formal job description, but taking it on and does two things. Number one, it builds relationships with teams outside of your own function, and they may actually be able to provide you opportunities. You know, they, they might say, hey, you know, I, I know, I know Errol's a great person to, to help out on this marketing, pro this huge marketing launch that we have. Mm -hmm. um, they'll make recommendations for you. And the second thing is it grows your skills. So you'll be able to grow your skills with real world data and real world opportunities that um, a side project probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do. Got it. So um, in general speaking, what are the wealthy goals to pursue to move up the ladder? Because um, I know this question is kind of open-ended because there are so many, even in a small companies or big companies. There are many different departments and product management covers many areas like operation, sales, marketing, you can be the interface to them. But um, generally speaking, if I want to move up the ladder, which area should I touch base on? It gave me, give me the more leverage to make my um, career advancement easier. Sales, sales. sales. If I had to pick sales one, pick one, one or two, sales or marketing. Yeah, you can. I guess you can think of it as one thing. But if I had to pick between sales or marketing, it depends. So if you're doing a lot of, you know, um, face to face stuff, like individual stuff, mm. like large, if it's large sort of software deals, then I would mm. focus on sales. If you're more sort of um, um, B 2 C, so if, mm. if if you have a website or you have an app and, and it's just you know people logging on, like for example. Um, uh like a food delivery app things like that i would focus on marketing because you're not necessarily interacting with your your, your users on a day-to-day -day basis whereas if you're, you're you're doing large software SaaS enterprise level sales but it was, uh, mm -hmm. uh products and you need to be able to close those prospects so sales and marketing um and it re really is i think of it as the skill of um uh bringing people over to the side to your side so it's it's almost mm -hmm. like um uh, persuading people to work together with you so that you can pursue a common goal. Those are the top top skills I would I would I would uh, I would I would say are most important. Mm, totally agree. Uh, on the point that you made on the sales and marketing, uh, which I hundred percent agree. Can you uh, tell me why is that a worth goal to go after? I want to know your rationale behind it. Yeah. So basically, everything in your in your life is is a form of sales. And, and marketing. So whether you know you're trying to get promoted, whether you're looking to, to switch jobs, whether um, you know you're starting your own business, that that's going to be um, the core. So you know a lot of these days there's something called there's a lot of um, you know a huge ruckus about something called product led growth. So you know we're not going to do any sales or marketing. We're just going to focus build a great product, which I agree with. But it is a form of 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 of, of of sales and marketing, you are persuading somebody to use your product based on mm. the great experience that you provide. So, mm. you know, you're not building for the sake of building, you're building to convert a prospect mm. to a user. And that's the same with if you have the, the mindset of, of a sales and marketing uh, mindset, you know, that will help you go a long way. You don't necessarily need to be a sales manager, you don't need to be a, a, a marketing VP, but you do yeah. need to be thinking from that perspective. Got it. Beautiful. So uh, assuming I, I've done all the things that you mentioned and I hit the top most like CPO, director or product management, then now what as a product manager? Yeah. So, you know, once you hit the top roles, like a, like a CPO or director of product management, I think you've, you've, you know, you've got a great set of skills that um, you, you can sort of move laterally. So you can maybe continue product management. Uh, or you can continue to 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 move upward. So, you know, I I, I think uh, something like a CEO role or COO role is perfectly within your reach. You know, you spent a lot of time thinking about the business holistically, mm -hmm. and I think that's one advantage of working in product management is you touch upon so many different areas. Yeah, and you have to be thinking about so many different areas. So all the skills that we talked about today, sales, marketing, operations, 
um, and thinking from a customer perspective, it just uh, puts you in a great, really great place to do a lot of different things. I don't think there's any sort of um, cap on, on, on how high you go. I think maybe the, the one thing that um, a lot of them could, you know, senior product people could work on is probably finance, getting, getting stronger finance skills, particularly if it's a, you know, a public company, there's certain sort of financial, um, certain ways of managing relationships uh, mm. that, that they need to, to get better with. But, you know, I think that that would be um, true for, for any person who's moving into a senior role at a public company. Totally agree. So uh, the last part of this session, I would like to talk about uh, the job that you are doing at High Hippo. Uh, and in High Hippo, uh, you have a lie. We help tech professionals find their dream jobs while simultaneously giving employers an easier and faster way to find star talents at a lower cost. Can we deconstruct this tagline of high people bit by bit? The first question is, what types of tech professional is high people helping? Yeah, so the, the, the niche that higher people focused on was um, employees at startups. So generally under, I would say about a hundred employees. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have, you know, so focus, the focus was on tech professionals within that niche and uh, it is an early stage startup. So the focus on um, one particular market, which was Toronto. And then, we, you know, hard people started out recruiting just sales, sales professionals at tech startups. Um, and as that segment grew, we expanded it to adjacent segments, such as marketers, uh, product managers, developers. So it's basically um, all of the key roles that you would find in a, a, a typical startup. Mm. Got it. So, uh, how do you define dream job for technology professional? So, for in terms of higher hippo, it was a job that they would feel fulfilled in, a job that they would feel happy about, and so that's how we thought about what is a dream job for tech professionals. Is what would make them, not us, not the company, mm -hmm. but our users, and also. Uh, the, the recruiting companies. So there, it's a two-sided marketplace. So you have both the job candidates who are looking for jobs, and then we also have, you know, companies who are hiring for it. So what are the jobs in terms of the, the, the candidate side? What are the jobs that fulfill them? And then how do we find the companies that provide those jobs for these professionals? How do we find those companies to get them onto the platform? So it was thinking not necessarily just from the candidate side, Mm -hmm. but also from the recruiter side. Mm, got it. So the fulfillment part. The reason why I'm asking this is uh, sometimes um, because I used to be a programmer and mm -hmm. then uh, I used to talk with a um, hiring manager or some um, uh, technology lead of some sort. Uh, they say something like, if you want a programmer to be happy, you have to let them know uh, their code will be deployed to production and the, uh, their uh, actual user is, uh, are using it. Uh, that's where the fulfillment comes from. Because, um, because I believe there are many different types of uh, uh, technology job uh, and um, the fulfillment part is very important. And yeah, that's the reason why I'm asking this. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of fulfillment, it's just, it, it's doing something that you enjoy, um, mm -hmm. that hopefully you're also good at, and mm -hmm. just makes you feel, you know, at a very deep level, just, mm -hmm. just content. You know, it's not maybe, probably not necessarily, uh, you know, you feel, oh, I'm so happy every day. It's just, you feel content. It feels right, basically. It mm -hmm. feels right for you. I think that's what I, what I would say is fulfillment is, or a fulfilling job is one that feels right for you. Got it. So, okay, the next, the next question is going to be the last question. Uh, who and what is the star talent from the employer's perspective? Uh, I want to say something more about this because in the tech world, uh, we often say some, uh, something like a star programmer 
can do uh, 10 times more than a average forward. Uh, so I want to see from the perspective from the perspective of the employers, what is a star talent in terms of, of course, not just programmer. It could be product manager or uh, ops or database administrator, anything, but I want to see of you. Yeah, so star talent from an employer's perspective is somebody who is proactive, who thinks about the business goals. Mm. So I think everything we've talked about so far in this podcast, mm. thinking not just of why you're building this, this feature, is thinking more so about what does this do for our business and what does this do for our customers and clients. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, so in addition to that, um, just somebody who is proactive about their own learning. So not only proactive about helping the business, but proactive mm -hmm. in growing their own skills. And also somebody who uh, proactively grows relationships within mm -hmm. the company and, and you know, with, with clients as well. So for example, um, as we mentioned before, helping out on projects, hey, you know, um, I know, you, you know, maybe you're a programmer and you're, mm -hmm. you've got a marketing colleague, or maybe let's just switch it around. Maybe you're a marketing, you're a marketer and you want, yep. you need to update the web page. Mm -hmm. So it's as simple as maybe you jump on Code Academy or, or any of these other treehouse, mm -hmm. learning a bit of HTML so that you can just update the page yourself, the landing mm -hmm. page, for example, you don't need a, you know, a programmer to, to do mm -hmm. it for you. It's, very simple, very, very simple. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, you know, star talent from an employer's perspective is somebody who um, is proactive about their own growth, about their relationships and, and um, the, proactive about the goals of the company. Got it. Mm, proactive in learning, proactive in, uh, I would like to say, maybe also working with each other and also, Mm, with a business focused mindset, uh, no matter which role that you are, even though you are a programmer, because at the end of the day, we have to care about the business. Uh, but um, uh, may I have one more question uh, before we end, we wrap up this session. I I'm just wondering, how do you know um, this kind of characteristic when you are screening star talent that you just mentioned? That is there a protocol or processes that you use to figure out if this guy is a star talent. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think there's a foolproof way mm -hmm. of, of, of verifying this. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some people are very good at, some people are very good at interviews. Mm -hmm. um, but it is just, I think, asking about uh, asking them about about their, their general mindset. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you can ask them, how do you see your relationship with with your colleagues? And then just mm. seeing where they go and then drilling deeper and deeper. So, you know, can you name a time where you uh, helped out on a project that was outside of your formal job description? Mm. That's one way. Um, and, and, you know, using, you know, in, in the past is not always a guide for the future, but using sort of um, asking them about situations in the past and in, in their past roles where, you know, they were proactive. Can you name a time where, um, you know, you had to learn something very quickly on your own, or it could mm. be what learning resources do you use or what blogs do you read? Things mm. like that. So basically uh, throwing out some questions to provoke their responses and see their thinking pattern behind the answer. Exactly, yeah. So thinking, asking questions that um, get a, a better idea of their mindset and not just mm. their skills and not just things they've done in the past, but getting a, a better idea of how they think about their career and how they think about working with other people, whether they're clients or internal colleagues. Got it, beautiful. So thank you very much, uh, Richmond. Uh, it's a nice catch up with you and uh, there are so many wisdom that uh, for my audiences. So thank you. You're welcome, yeah. I hope it's been helpful for your listeners. <laughs>